Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And I was recently invited to speak at Oxford University, where I gave a talk on what it was like to work at Microsoft in the 1990s and on certain projects like Task Manager, Space Cadet Pinball, Windows Product Activation, and so on. Today, as you can see, I've got my editing hat and safety goggles on because I'm putting together a little synopsis of the Q&A session from the end of the speech. The questions range from product activation to where I went on my honeymoon, so here are the more interesting technical responses edited together for your convenience. I'm long since retired from Microsoft, and I wasn't an official spokesperson when I was there. So as always, these are my opinions only. Enjoy. What is that pin that you're wearing? Oh, it's a little uh, icon of Task Manager, actually. It's the Windows XP Task Manager. Um, in the process performance page, I believe. Do you still consult with the task manager team at all? No, uh, the only contact I've had with task manager was when I decided to uh, go back and look at it. There had been a source code leak, I believe came out of Korea. And so I was very tempted because I hadn't seen the code to task manager in about 20, 25 years. And I wanted to see it, it had leaked. And I wanted to do a video on it. So I contacted Microsoft and I said, this is my conundrum, what can I do? And they said, don't look at this le leaked source code. We'll send you the original Windows XP source code, which they did, and they gave me that for post-mortem. But it was all very much stuff that I had worked on. So I have not seen any version of Task Manager or any code for it any newer than when I worked there in 2003, which is almost 20 years ago now. So, What software makes you feel powerful and in control of your machine besides Task Manager? Um, I don't know about today, but in the old days, I really felt powerful when I had Norton Utilities because you would do pretty much anything. You'd go and edit your disk sectors if you wanted, unlink files, and even undelete files by relinking files back into the file allocation table and all kinds of knobs and things that you shouldn't be touching as a normal user, but it gave you that power. And uh, Peter Norton, the guy who wrote it initially, must have been you know, a similar person in that he really wanted access to know where totally what was going on in the system. And, that tool really gave you total control over, well, I guess it was only MS-DOS, there were versions for Windows, but I'm really thinking of the old MS-DOS versions where uh, it was like a Swiss army knife that gave you the ability to do almost anything with your system. Is Task Manager your favorite piece of software that you've written? I think it actually is because it's something that started out as a personal project, as something I wanted to do, and it kind of has a little bit of me in it because it is the way that I wanted it to be initially without regard to what other consumers or users or anybody wanted it to be because I was just writing it for myself initially. And I think when you do something like that, if it happens to work well for other people because it resonates with them, then everything you liked about it hopefully applies. And so everything that you like about Task Manager are probably the reasons why I like it too. And it's not because I created it, it's just because it's a handy thing to have around. And there were versions in Unix of top and HTOP and things that certainly resemble it before it was all kind of pulled together into this one Windows unification piece. But um, yeah, I would say it is probably my uh, favorite piece that I worked on. Did you hide any Easter eggs within Task Manager? No, there are absolutely zero Easter eggs in Task Manager. I never put one in there. I'm, I'm not like an anti-Easter egg guy, but it's something I've never done because I've always felt that if you're using an operating system, you don't want it to have secrets that it hasn't told you yet. Um, it's one thing for your productivity software to have a hidden Easter egg, but when you're dealing with an operating system that's running a nuclear reactor, or who knows what you're doing with it, you probably don't want it to have a lot of weird secrets behind the scenes. So it was something that just uh, philosophically we didn't do a lot of. So there might have been some in the higher user interface, but once you get down to the core of the system, that kind of vanity, there isn't really room for it, I don't think. Not in an operating system, anyway. What are your opinions of Windows 10? I haven't seen it. I, you know, I, I retired 20-some years ago, so they're not keeping me up to speed with their design decisions anymore. Um, I, from what I have seen, it looks kind of interesting, but I, I, it remains to be seen if it's an improvement or if it's just a change. I guess we'll find out shortly. We all get a chance to play with it at some point. Is Space Cadet Pinball secretly hidden anywhere within Windows? No, it would be lovely to do that. The only problem is Microsoft doesn't have the license for it. And so as I understand it, the license that I read said that they have the right to ship it in an operating system in the way they did in the Plus Packs and then Windows 95 and NT. But they have to do certain things like release it in all the operating systems and I guess porting it to a bunch of different platforms at this point. It's really old code now and it came from a game company before I even touched it. So it's got some ancient stuff in there that's hard to bring along in today's world. But the game actually still does run on Windows and you can find it. It's just something I don't think they want to support officially as a company, but it's out there to play. So, 
What were the best and worst parts of working at Microsoft in the 1990s? I think really the best thing, I don't want to be flippant, but the best thing really was lunch because you have a group of just incredibly hyper smart people that are far smarter than you and you get to go with them and hang out at lunch and ask them questions and they have fascinating con er, conversations and so on. And it's just a great social environment, I think. It's the part that I miss working there. You can get the technical challenges working on your own and that kind of thing, but you can't get that kind of interaction with people that are very much alike in that sense. Uh, you don't run into that at the grocery store very often. So that's what I miss the most. In terms of what I miss the least, I would guess it is the sometimes back then there was this expectation it wasn't how much you should work or how much is enough it's how much could you work and could you work more than you currently are and you don't want that to always be the benchmark of could you do more because it's kind of a, a guilt-ridden way to work yeah you could always probably do something more so that was kind of a stressful uh you come out of college you always have that i could be doing more i could be studying more and then you get to work and it's like well i went home but i could be doing more you'd like to get out of that loop eventually i think at least have kids or do something else with it so if you have pride in your products, shouldn't you say drinking your own champagne instead of eating your own dog food when running test builds? Um, it doesn't taste like champagne for the first two years, though. That's the problem. It tastes a lot like dog food when you're running it. I ran a lot of beta versions, so probably from the year 1993 up until the mid-2000s, I was always, and my wife, my poor wife at some point, always running a beta version of Windows that's always probably blue screening ten times as much as you're used to Windows ever failing because I'm running pre-release versions of it. So... That's what we're calling the dog food. By the time you ship it, then you got champagne, caviar, whatever you're into. But along the way, mm, it, it's crunchy. Did you work on Windows product activation? I did the initial version of Windows activation, me and a couple of developers. We took the Office product activation math and elliptical curve cryptography and all of their functionality and added some Windows obfuscation and deep level stuff to make it harder to debug and all that kind of nonsense that you need for software protection and kind of packaged it up for Windows. And that came with a key system, as you know, where you enter these long keys and those long keys have payloads and in the payload is a product ID and a unique serial number and that kind of thing that breaks out. So our code was the code that would call that code and figure out how to break out your PID and what product you had and whether to enforce it, whether you were within your license agreements and all that kind of thing. Um, it was never really a hunt down and find the pirates kind of mission. It was really twofold. It was let honest people be honest, make it useful so that you can find out if a version is activated uniquely or not. Because before that, it was kind of hard to tell how many times had you used a particular product key unless you kept your own spreadsheet. Um, and then there was also stop the really basic piracy of mom and pop shops or even big box stores just using the same copy of Windows over and over and over when they sell a PC because that was a big cause of leakage for them. It wasn't so much individual users going out and copying disks at you know, group club meetings. It was industrial duplication of the software, I think, was the biggest thing they were trying to stop there. Did you work on Microsoft Xenix? I didn't work on Xenix. I was there at the same time, kind of the tail end of it, and I was always kind of surprised that why did Microsoft run off and invent OS2 or run off and invent Windows NT when they had Windows uh, Xenix or Xenix to um, start with as a base point. And it turns out I think the AT&T licensing is a real juggernaut that runs behind it. So if you want to play with that operating system or use it for anything, you were picking up a huge amount of AT&T, and at that time I think AT&T was being broken up by the U.S. government, and they weren't even sure which companies were going to own which pieces of this operating system when it was all said and done. So it was kind of a minefield, I think, at the time. Um, I don't know that much about the, the corporate history of Xenix, but uh, I find it surprising that Microsoft basically owned the PC version of Unix, Xenix, Linux, whatever you want to call it, at the time and never went anywhere with it. It just, there wasn't, apparently, the market demand for it. So it's, I don't want to say they were ahead of their time, but it's very weird that they had it and nobody wanted it, it seems, so... Beyond that, it must have died somewhere just before OS 2, 1.2, I would guess, somewhere in that range. How did you connect remotely to debug things over the phone back in the 1990s? Uh, in the 1990s, it was very rudimentary. We had two basic mechanisms that you could... Uh, make sure I'm, I want to check my mic. Uh, there were two basic mechanisms by which you connect. There was an FTP gateway and a Telnet gateway. And as you can guess... They were both gateways that led into the corporate network, but you went through this extra firewall step of an independent system that had extra credentials and then logged you into the domain and so on. But it was all purely text-based. There was obviously no web yet, and there was no 
graphical debugger or anything. It was strictly like a machine language monitor across a text connection that you would get by dialing into a RAS modem with you know a 14.4 modem. So very basic, but it did exist and allowed us to, in the middle of the night, connect and debug something if something had crashed and hung in the build lab, that type of thing. Are you the same Dave Plummer that holds the world record for the classic game Tempest? It is. Uh, I set that when I was initially 14 and then somebody beat it again and I've had to beat it a few times along the way because every about every 10 years it seems that somebody beats the score and I have to come back out of retirement and beat it again. I have one in my garage here actually and the machine on it, I was, it's a long story that I can't tell you now, but it turned out to be the machine of the person that wrote the video game Tempest, David Thurr. And the high score table has his scores on the top of the game. So I can't beat the game because it's got his scores on it. So I just make sure I never go over his scores. But I have another machine downstairs in the basement that I do play. And really, Tempest is one of the few games that I play. And I'll come out of boredom and I'll play it for every day for three or four weeks straight until I get frustrated with it. And then I won't touch it for six months. And I'll play Geometry Wars or something else on the Xbox. But... I'm not a big gamer, I'm really a very casual gamer, so if it's got like bright vector, red, green, blue colors, and it's intense, I'll play it for a short amount of time. That's kind of how I game. I wonder if you'll notice that I'm not actually wearing my glasses. Oops. 